All right. So what I want to do right now is give you a little bit of background on the Reconstruction period. Um, what we'll be doing in class is going through different ways that people have remembered Reconstruction and different ways that historical accounts have described this period because we'll find that the view of Reconstruction has changed over time. Now in order to help us understand those different historical texts that have depicted Reconstruction, I want to give you some background on this period so we kind of have a basic background and we know what we're dealing with. So the place that we need to start in order to do this is the end of the Civil War. We've just had a civil war between the North and the South. Uh, the key issue is that the South wanted the right uh, to maintain the slavery system in its states, and as we know, uh, the North won this war, but there are still open questions about what to do in the South. Um, many of these have to do with the freed slaves, right? We had all these slaves, and according to uh, various acts of government, including the Emancipation Proclamation and subsequent laws, um, they can't be slaves anymore. So what are they going to do for work? Now, one natural thing that they could do for work is what they have been doing for work for generations. That is, they could be agricultural laborers. They could be farmers, basically. But where do they work? Do they work on their own land? That's what most white people have done, is work their own land. But at this point, freed slaves don't have land. Should the government go in and distribute land, the so-called 40 acres and a mule, uh, to various freed slaves? Perhaps African Americans could buy their land. However, as slaves, they don't really have much money. Um, do they work for someone else uh, in return for wages or a share of the produce from that land? These questions need to be settled. Another question that needs to be settled is, OK, are these freed slaves going to be citizens? Can they vote? Um, because this was not a given. Um, historically, only white persons had voted. Um, and so this is something that needs to be decided, and people have different views about whether uh, black males, because after all, only men were able to vote even among white people, um, whether black males would be able to vote. A third question is, who's going to be in charge in this new South, right? Will it be the same people who were in charge in the old South, the planter elite? Uh, many Republicans, and remember the North was dominated by the Republicans who uh, champion the Union, many Republicans don't want the old guard to be back in charge of the South. You could argue that they're being vindictive because they just won a war against these people, or you could argue that the war started because you had people in charge of the, in the South, and we don't want those same people to be ruling in the same way. So uh, that could be one answer. You could have the planter elite. If you're not going to have the old planter elite in charge, who's going to do it? Are you going to have Northerners come in and them be in charge? Are you going to have a different group of Southerners, uh, like Southern Republicans? There were some of those. Um, are you going to have African Americans in charge of the South? After all, they are citizens now. right? You could do various things. And these are the debates that need to be threshed out in the years after the end of the Civil War. And during this Reconstruction period, uh, we're going to see the establishment of a new political and economic order um, that overthrows the old guard. Uh, however, the old guard is going to eventually make a comeback. And this happens in various places at various times. Uh, it, the date often used is 1877 for uh, reasons that you have discussed in junior history or will discuss. Um, but the point I want to make here is that it depends from state to state as to when the old guard really takes back over. This period from 1865 to around 1877 um, is remembered in different ways by different people over time. And whether this is a tragedy that the Reconstruction South was overturned or um, or a good thing, the, the South being redeemed in 1877, depends on your perspective. So to give you a little bit of background about what happened during this Reconstruction period, um, I want to frame it first in a congressional debate. Now, I, and this is something that can get really complex, and I'm going to gloss over much of the congressional wrangling, um, but I will just focus on a split between radicals and moderates within the Republican Party. Remember, the Republicans are the ruling party. Um, after the Civil War. And there is a split among them between radicals who want to really overhaul the South and moderates who want to be a little bit more, I guess, uh, careful, uh, be a little bit more tempered. 
Um, for example, the radicals want to throw out, throw out all ex-Confederates uh, from government. Uh, they push for full suffrage for all black males. Um, they usually fall, sort, uh, fall short of recommending distribu distribution of land, um, but they're at least closer in that direction than are the moderates. The moderates certainly are not going to redistribute land to the ex-slaves, um, and in particular, they're pretty cautious about suffrage. They're not sure if uh, black people or certainly all black males should be given the vote. Now, they are wrangling with one another, um, and another character in this mix is Andrew Johnson. Now, Andrew Johnson is the president after Abraham Lincoln is assassinated. Um, and ironically, or surprisingly, he's a Democrat. And he's a Democrat because in 1864, uh, Lincoln was trying to shore up support um, and thought he could have a ticket with a Republican and a Democrat. Obviously, once he's assassinated, this has unintended consequences. And so we have Johnson in charge, and he is pushing hard back against the Republicans in their efforts to reform the South. Johnson doesn't want uh, the old guard to be changed very much. Now, these debates are gridlocked, but certain developments in the South kind of change the direction of the debate towards the favor of the, uh, the radicals. Um, one of these is we start to see evidence of these various mechanisms that are being used to uh, resubjugate uh, freed slaves. An example of this can be found in the Mississippi Black Codes. These Black Codes were various laws about uh, various laws that would govern African Americans in the South. In particular, the way these laws treated black laborers created a highly problematic system. I have a couple of examples of these laws. One law says, if a black laborer shall quit the service of his employer before the expiration of his term of service without good cause, he shall forfeit his wages for that year up to the time of quitting. Meaning that if you quit your job after three months, you lose all of that pay. And needless to say, that's going to make you not very likely to quit your job. Another one says everyone, a lot of white people, not just like sheriffs and police, but everyone may arrest and carry back to his or her legal employer any freedman, free negro, or mulatto who shall have quit the service of his or her employer before the expiration of his, his or her term of service without good cause. That is, if you find someone, a black person, who is not working for the person they're supposed to be working for, you can take them back by force and make them work. In other words, we're starting to have a system in the post-slavery South that's starting to look suspiciously like slavery. You have contracts that make it very hard for people to quit working for someone and make it so that if you leave the service of your employer, you can be forcibly returned to your employer. Additionally, laws are passed that say in order to do non-agricultural work, you need a license. And basically, if you were black, it was very hard to get one of these licenses to do non-agricultural work. So we have various means by which African Americans are subjugated into these very low-paying agricultural jobs, and we have this slave-like system replacing slavery. Additionally, you have violence breaking throughout the South. Uh, this violence was perpetrated by the newly uh, formed KKK and other white military groups like the White League. And basically, these are efforts to keep the newly freed African Americans in line and intimidate people. And we'll return to this in a second. So I bring up these examples to talk about some of the things that are pushing Congress in a more radical direction. It becomes clear that if we leave the white uh, the South uh, to its own devices, we're going to end up with a system that looks a lot like the Old South. The result is something called radical reconstruction. Um, and among many things that change during radical reconstruction, we see uh, guaranteed citizenship for all African Americans. Um, and in the 15th Amendment, we see universal suffrage for all black males. And we see the Harper's Weekly in the corner depicting a black man going to the polls. Now I want to turn my attention to what happens in the South with regards to who ends up in charge, who has political power. Um, one answer to this question is the people who get in charge are carpetbaggers and scalawags. These are terms with decidedly negative connotations that are used to describe the new white people who are in charge in the South. A carpetbagger is a northerner who came to the South to exploit its resources. So this is like hey, there are these outsiders coming from the north that just want to take advantage of us southerners. Um, they don't have our welfare in mind. Now, undoubtedly, there were people who came from the north who were 
um, not the most moral and were out for their own benefit, but it's also, also worth noting that many of these so-called carpetbaggers were teachers. They were officers of the Freedmen's Bureau who helped um, African Americans. They were former Union soldiers who set up productive lives uh, as, as farmers. There were businessmen who brought commerce to the South. There were various things, and they were not all kind of destructive of the South. Scalawags was a term for white Republicans born in the South. Now, it is true, white Republicans ended up having a lot of political power. Um, but the term, scalawag, implies that they are somehow traitors to their race or traitors to their religion, basically that they are evil in some way. And indeed, uh, modern historians are reluctant to think of all white Republicans in this manner. So terms like carpetbagger and scalawag are less accurate descriptor, uh, descriptors of the people, the white people who got power in the Reconstruction South, but rather they are useful labels that help us understand how some members of the South sought to discredit those who replaced the pre-Civil War social and polit political elite. The other group of people who ended up having some level of political power in the South are African Americans. And hence we get another sort of myth, and that is the myth of black domination. This was the, the specter that a lot of people uh, held up and said, hey, you better not vote for the Republicans because otherwise you'll end up with black domination. Certainly, there were a lot of black people in the South, and once they could vote, they often voted for black candidates. As we can see in this map, if you look at each pie chart in each state, you're seeing a racial breakdown. Um, and the purple and the red is the black po population. As you can see, in places like Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, South Carolina, etc., you end up with some regions that have almost a majority of African Americans. In fact, in places like South Carolina and Mississippi, majority African American populations. And they voted in large numbers, and they elected Republicans, many of them blacks. Um, for example, um, Hiram Revels um, is the first black senator. He was elected in 1870. Um, typical of many of the black, black politicians of the time, he was an ordained minister. Uh, these tended to be uh, middle and upper class people rather than former slaves. Uh, to give you some statistics, uh, 20 African Americans were uh, in major state government roles like Secretary of State, Lieutenant Governor. Um, 600 state legislators were elected. 16 U.S. congressmen. There was a substantial amount of political empowerment for African Americans. However, it's also worth noting that black domination is not the most uh, uh, accurate descriptor since the number of black politicians was never proportional to the black population. There were, there were fewer um, African American actual political figures than you'd expect given how many black people there were. Um, and certainly the characterization of, of African Americans as vindictive, crude people out to punish the whites is not terribly accurate. In this Reconstruction South, we will see this new political order go in that indeed is made up of white Republicans and African Americans in large part, but maybe doesn't uh, fit with the kind of negative stereotypes that would develop over the years and would, would uh, would be very important in the early histories of the period. Eventually, this movement um, of Reconstruction is going to be countered by a counter-revolution. That is, these moves that gave African Americans more rights, politically, economically, and so forth, um, are going to be rebuffed by a counter-revolution of the pre-Civil War elite. They want to get their power back, and they do it in a number of ways, um, and they succeed in, as they put it, redeeming the South. One way in which they redeem the South is that they do it, one might call this legitimately. Um, they win elections. However, they win the elections by appealing to the lower <laughs> motives in people, um, per, uh, you know, appealing to race loyalty, uh, calling people carpetbaggers and scalawags, and raising fears of black domination. However, the other major method that the old guard uses to retake power is violent takeover. This is where you get groups like the Ku Klux Klan and the White League who are using violence in order to uh, retake political power. Uh, black and Republican politicians are murdered. Black schools and churches are burned down. Uh, they, are, uh, they threaten violence against people who intend to vote Republican, particularly African Americans, um, and perhaps the most illustrative example of the way in which violence was used to retake the South is the Colfax riot.
So what we see here is a historical marker for the Colfax riot. It's in Louisiana. Um, and it's very revealing in terms of the way Reconstruction has been remembered uh, throughout the country, but particularly in the South. Um, it says, on this site occurred the Colfax riot in which three white men and 150 Negroes were slain. Already we should notice the imbalance between those numbers as uh, suspicious. Then it says, this event on April 13th, 1873 marked the end of carpetbag misrule in the South. Hopefully you noticed uh, the loaded language there. By calling it the end of carpetbag misrule, it's characterizing Reconstruction government in a certain way and the redemption that came afterwards, I use that term in air quotes, um, the redemption that occurred afterwards and it, it depicts in a much more positive light. Now, what happened at Colfax? Well, uh, long story short, there was a contested election in Louisiana in which both Republicans and Democrats claimed victory in the governor's race. Ultimately, the federal government weighed in and ruled on behalf of the Republican governor. However, when the Republican governor tried to take office, um, the White League, a white military group, um, attacked the Republicans and African Americans throughout the state. And the biggest violence was seen in Colfax. Um, there, the White League attacked a nearly all-black militia that was protecting the elected government in a courthouse. The white forces eventually surround the courthouse and overwhelm it. At this point, they set it on fire. Um, some African Americans fleed the courthouse. They were caught and executed. Others tried to surrender but were killed uh, in the process. Others did successfully surrender but were taken prisoner and executed later that night. And that's how 150 African Americans died. Colfax is thus the most egregious example of the way uh, the Democrats used force to retake power in the South, but it's not the only example. And what will come next is the throughout the South, Democrats are going to retake power and we'll see less and less political will on behalf of the North and the Republican Party to counter that trend. Basically, for a while, Northern federal troops can keep order in the South and keep violence from taking over. Um, however, uh, the will to do this uh, falls apart um, because for several reasons, I guess. I mean, one is that uh, plenty of Northerners don't particularly care about protecting the rights of, um, of the newly freed African-American slaves. Another reason is that the Republican Party lost credibility amidst a lot of scandals. Um, the other thing is that it was a very costly thing to do, and especially after the Depression of 1873, um, where there are meager resources, plenty of people don't want those government resources spent fighting a very hard battle to keep control of the South. The result is that the North pulls out and the white Southerners retake power, and we basically have one party rule of the Democrats for about a century. Uh, the result, therefore, is we get what is called the Jim Crow South. Um, we'll learn about what happens after circa 1877 in a future lesson, but we're actually, what we're actually going to do tomorrow is focus on the way Reconstruction has been remembered. Um, what I just gave you here is pretty in tune with modern scholarship on Reconstruction, but Reconstruction hasn't always been uh, recounted that way in historians' work. Um, we'll read textbooks from various points in history and see how the emphases and value judgments made about Reconstruction have changed over time. Uh, this will tell a very interesting story about Reconstruction. It will tell a very interesting story about American history and how, as America has changed, so has the history of Reconstruction. And it will also tell, I think, a, a pretty useful story about history in general, which is that we tell our versions of the past based on our own values in the present. And thus, you know, we always should be looking at when uh, something was written and try to connect the way we view the past with the way we view our own present.